Many people go around with a longing inside, a desire to fill the emptiness that they sense within, a lack of meaning in their life. Join me now in meeting some of these who for a long time have sensed a longing for something more. You started to visit different assemblies and, and look for fellowship there? Uh, something had happened on the inside and I did start to read the Bible and, and uh, met some people who were sincere. But many of the people we met, and especially the churches, it seemed like it was mostly entertainment. It was, uh, it was just entertainment. I already knew what entertainment was, and maybe better entertainment than they could offer, but uh, it, that, that wasn't, it didn't meet the need. Yeah. Not least when, when uh, like I'd had that one experience, I couldn't think a good thought. So just to go and get a different feeling, that doesn't help for that. But what was it that actually brought you to that uh, where your longing was fulfilled? How did that go? I was keenly aware of my sin and the power of sin. And all these Christian assemblies, they weren't helping me to deal with this power that I, I knew what I was being tempted to. I, I could hold it in, you know, by, by God's grace I could hold things in, but it was just boiling in there. And to go to church and just to pray and those things were really they were really satisfying for I looked forward to getting up and going early to church and and but I could go and get a good experience but when I walked out again it was gone everything that makes me unhappy it's not the world it's not people it's not um my family or anything like that it's 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 myself it's actually my my own sin that makes me unhappy and I could actually really think about it and actually say that's that's very true that my sin actually causes my own happiness. I can't blame anyone else for it. I looked everywhere. I put my backpack on and started, I heard about a group in New England and so I hitchhiked up there and I went to Colorado and upper New York State searching and searching. And I knew what I wanted to do but I didn't, there was no way, there was no, uh, no footsteps. And then I met people who had been living a life and they said it's a good life. It's, it works. It's help. I, I have a good relationship with my wife. I, I have uh, one of the things I said was, "Come and see. Come and visit our home. See how we live. See how we have it." Yeah, and Th that spoke to your heart then. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I, w I didn't want a religion. I wanted a life. That for me is the is the biggest attraction. Is a it, it's a life that people live. It's not just in the words because. Um, you know, talk is cheap. You know, if you don't love the word, then it's completely, there's no power in it. It's, it's hypocrisy. And at a, at a certain point then you met, uh, you went to the, uh, the, uh, to the church meeting, a church meeting, and there you met uh, the brothers. I had a real attitude then. I thought, these Christians, it would be nice to meet some Christians and tell them what I think. They're a bunch of hypocrites and it's all show. I, I just had a lot of opinions about those things in my high-mindedness. But I went and I met him, and there were people who would look you in the eye, and you you could you could sense it was real. They they, they had a life, and they had a care. It, it was it, I can't quite put it into words, but you sensed there's something real here. These people are true, real people. Like for me, it was like I heard at last the way, the way that the the way to life, the way to have this sin you know, not only held back or, you know, pressed down, but it could be destroyed. Oh, I, I tell you. Yeah, so that, that, <clears throat> that was, it was then that you would say that that longing finally was uh, met. It was, it was nourished for the first time. Mm -hmm. How would you say the, that the gospel helps you in your daily life today? The gospel is about Jesus and the life he lived is that is the life I want to live. A man full of wisdom and authority and power and love and meekness and gentleness and uh, that, that is a life when, you, when you're not overcome by your own nature and by the negative, the evil. And he overcame and that is an inspiration and it's a, it's a help. I can pray to him, I can look to him and get the help and power to follow him. When I, when I came among the friends and I heard the gospel. It was practical Christianity. It was Christianity that works. 
It was Christianity that, that helped me to love my wife. And, and Christianity that helped me to be good to my son. Yeah, I want to praise God with all my heart for the glorious hope of the gospel. And it stands firm and strong. Unshakable is the hope in the gospel. For all those who are interested in victory over sin, all those who want to come to full liberty from slavery under sin, for you there is a tremendous hope. And that is the hope we preach in the gospel. And it has nothing to do with your family and your friends and what you've lived up to today. If you lay hold of faith in your heart and believe in your heart, and Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you, and you will become a new person. You will be transformed and made into Jesus' image. You will come forth out of a life of slavery into a life of victory, if that's what you really want. All those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will not be put to shame. They will experience that God fills them with righteousness. And they are made into human beings. They are unshakable. They are strong in their faith. Because they have got a hold of God's Spirit and because they believe in the hope that's in the gospel. It's a tremendous hope. And there's hope for all those who sorrow and mourn over themselves. Jesus said, they will be comforted. How many people are interested in that today? There's very, very few who are mourning over themselves. The vast majority of people are mourning over others. Everything else they haven't, others haven't done to me, etc., etc. So I praise God with all my heart for the gospel. And I want to read something in um, 1 Peter 2 we heard last weekend. It says there in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, from the beginning... Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, and we can very, very well say all hypocrisy, all envy, and all evil speaking. Yeah, how much is left then? All of us who can read English, we understand that that means everything. There's nothing left. And uh, this is where Satan has his deception. He plays with your mind. So you should start thinking it's not so serious with all. But I can guarantee you that if you don't bother to do all in every shape or form as far as your light shines, then Satan will have his power in your life. And sooner or later, he'll, he'll take one little finger and he'll take the whole hand. He'll take his arm, your arm. And he'll take your heart, he'll take your eyes, he'll take everything. So the only way to conquer him is to destroy all. And then we have God's promises on our side. As it says in verse next verse, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. What is it that hinders your growth? Why aren't you growing? Why aren't you going from one glory to the next? Why is it the person doesn't do that? It's very simple here. It says that they haven't been doing, they haven't been quitting themselves off with all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy. We can add, there's another area in one's life that's very prone to young people, and that is all conceit. And uh, we speak about idols, but when, when you think about it, who is the idol for the vast majority of almost every person alive? That is myself. And um, 
It doesn't take much for a person to start to come into thoughts of conceit. That is, comes very quickly. You think you are something. You think you're something a little more special than others. And the gifts that God has given you, one can glorify oneself and the gifts that God has given to you that you should be using for other people. God has made you and created you as he has and how the devil comes in through that beautiful, pure creation, the way God wanted you to be, and he is reaching his arms in and he wants to get a hold of your heart into your thoughts, the ugly, evil thoughts, so that you start thinking you are something. But none of us are anything. We are nothing. Every single one of us. And it's only because of God's tremendous grace that I'm allowed, like we heard here, to sit here and hear the sharp word of God that is able to save my soul, that is able to save me from my own conceit, that is able, and conceit will eat you, it will destroy your life, it will take away your purity. And your innocence. That's the work of Satan. We can... It's interesting to watch young people. We see today. There is, there's some young people. They, it's almost like they take a straight line. And uh, it's amazing to watch. They, they get grace over their life. And it goes forward. And they develop. And, and they're happy. And they're new people. And then you see other young people. They're the same age. And they're going there. And they're... Whoosh, and you notice in the spirit, there is no, there's no yes and amen and no and yes, like Jesus said. Let your words be yes, yes, and let them be no, no. And because you don't have that yes, yes, and no, no in your life, you have a spirit that sort of. So when they meet you, it's, how's it going with you? Yeah, everything's all fine, great, wonderful. But you know, if you just think back in your heart and you let God's Spirit examine what's going on there, you know it's not completely the way it should be. And of course there's no growth. There's no development, as Peter says. Every year I'm carrying on with the same thing. But that isn't the hope of the gospel. That's not why we get together. That's not why we encourage one another. We encourage one another. We're here so that we can, we can get the recipe and find the way to true happiness. And um, it's interesting to watch as well. It's very, very interesting. So this is the way we can read that in Hebrews uh, chapter 1. Or we can, sorry, we can continue reading. There was something very important there. I want to read it. In 1 Samuel 15, we can go back there. And it says there in... Um, yeah, there it says in verse... Uh, we can read there in verse um, 16. And Samuel said to be, Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to me, Speak on. Saul, he was full of all kinds of excuses. And that's the way you can see it here as well today, when you hear a word like this. And you can find yourself loads of excuses. Or you can explain away to yourself why I haven't taken it quite as seriously as I should. And everyone is, you know, if you knew my situations, and, and explain and explain and explain yourself. So you feel at the end of the meeting you're quite satisfied, you're quite well with yourself that I have a good reason. I have good reason why I haven't lived the life that I should be living. Maybe. And as long as you explain that away to yourself, then you're explaining away your own salvation. It's much better to sit there and mourn. It's much better to, and I've done that. I've done that. And I continue to do it and mourn over myself, over my own stubbornness, over my own wretchedness. And that brings you tremendous joy and happiness because the truth hurts. But the truth is the way to tremendous development. And he said in verse 17, And so Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? 
And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Oh, you can say, well, what it was, how, where is the connection here? Oh, when you are little in your own eyes, when you are little in your own eyes, isn't it very important to do what God says? When I'm very little in my own eyes, let's say I'm working with my boss at work, and the first day you're on a, on a job, then it's easy to be there and be very quiet and listen and be very small in your own eyes because you don't have any experience, you don't really know what you're doing, and you're sitting there very, uh, how do we say, compliant, or one, one is very uh, uh, easy to talk to and easy to, to be exhorted and easy to be told what to do in the beginning. But as time goes by, I can be a little bit sort of cocky and suddenly I know how things should be done. But in the same way it can be when it concerns my life with God, I have to remain as a little tiny person in my own eyes. And if I do that, ha, huh, then it's very important to do what God says. Then when the Spirit speaks in my heart, then I'm all ears. I'm all ears. How are we? How are we? How are you in the daily life when the Spirit reminds you, don't do that. Don't follow that way. Don't listen to this. Don't do this. Do this. How big are you in your own eyes then? All those who are small in their own eyes, they're, oh, I must do what the Spirit says. I must listen right away. Now I have to do exactly that. And certainly not this. That's, uh, that's the way to real joy. But Saul, he, he lost his poverty of spirit. He lost his littleness in his own eyes. And he suddenly became something important. Me as well. Me as well. I'm also important here. I'm not, just, I'm not a complete idiot. You guys also have to listen to me. But all those young people who are kept in this poverty of spirit and continue, and, and as long as we're on that way, keep on humbling ourselves, keep on humbling ourselves, not setting any limits, but just let God break us down. Let one situation come after the next and continue to humble myself, continue to humble myself. Then I get grace over my life. So instead of walking and going into situations where I realize what in the world was I thinking about, where was I there, and what was, what was on my mind in this situation, etc., I, instead of living that corner, instead of, instead of living the kind of life where I'm looking back and, oh, I regret this, and, oh, I was so stupid there, and why didn't I listen to God there, and I was so stubborn here. Instead of living that life, then I thank God. I get grace. I get grace. I start listening. I become small in my own eyes. And God lets it succeed. Instead of being the same old stubborn person that the others are having to suffer along with and bear with and etc. Now they're having to do with a person that's, what has happened? What has happened? Well, we know what's happened. Someone has, has kicked their own ego out the door and said, I'm finished with myself. I'm finished with being the guy who knows everything. I want to listen. I want to be broken in my spirit. And then God is able to work with us. So I praise God and when you see such ones who live this life I'm speaking about now, there's something that's really, really tangible, and that is that they're happy. They are extremely happy. Why? Because they don't have so much to take care of. They don't have all these worries and things, and I'm this guy, and I'm that, and this person, I'm take heed to me, and I'm important. No, I, have, I don't need to worry about anything. I just got to worry about... Uh, my little self and my little, my little life and see to it that I'm following God's instruction. And that leads you to a glorious, happy life. So I praise God for the hope of the gospel. Let's, let's walk on this way. Let's be humble in the depths of our heart. Let's, let's seek God while we still have a chance. So all disobedience becomes a past history. It's a past history. So that I know in my heart that I'm, I'm starting new chapters, new, new ways in my life. And I'm going to go on to perfection, on to development. So when they see you and me in the future, they're going, oh, it tastes something new here. There's something glorious. There's something so edifying. There's something so good to be with.
to me, he's someone that I can just tell everything. I can tell him whatever I want and I know that he's listening and I know that all he wants to do is help me. I can always pray to him for help and I know that he, yeah, it really helps me that I know that he's always there for me and he always wants it to go very well for me. And then it's written in Romans, you are, you are that one slave whom you obey. So do you want to be a slave of Jesus or a slave of sin like the rest of the world? You look around you, everyone's a slave of sin. They think they're doing what they want, but they're bound and they're, they're caught up in their own situations and their own problems and they don't know that Jesus is the answer. But I believe that he was exactly like you and I and that he was tempted in every area, but he chose to do the, the right thing and he chose to say no. What was bad, he said no, and what was good, he said yes. I know he's, he's overcome in his life in the same situations and difficulties I come into. And so I know I can do that because he's done it before me. And if I don't learn to hate those things in my own life, those lusts in my own flesh, if I don't hate those things like Jesus hated them, then I, I am not his disciple. And, um, when we get converted, that is the beginning. And for me now it's a case of every day I can learn to be like him because I'm not like him. But every day I can learn that, so at the end of my life, I can be more like Jesus. Like the verse that says, um, he's also able to save to the uttermost because he lives to make intercession for them. And he can help us get free from what we're bound by and all those lusts and desires and inclinations that, that hold us to the earth. He's always there, he's praying for me, he's fighting for me, because he wants me to be able to overcome my sin. Evangelium i Og det sa han jo lenge før Golgata. Hver dag må vi ta vårt kors opp og følge mesteren. Hvis vi vil være disippel av ham og komme der han har kommet. Det er jo alle de apostler og profeter og de hellige som har levd. De har fullt mesteren. Det er kongsveien inn i Guds rike. Korsets vei. Det er ingen annen vei som duger. Men den duger. Da blir du lykkelig, og da blir du glad. For den som vil berge sitt liv skal miste det. Men den som mister sitt liv for min skyld, han skal berge det. Og når du ser på alle de mennesker som lever og hele livet er de opptatt av å berge sitt liv for mest mulig ære, mest mulig penger, mest mulig av de jordiske. Og så ser vi dem da på slutten av livet. Gå på gamle hjem og se dem på slutten av livet. De må gå fra alt sammen i sannhet de har mistet sitt liv. Se på en som Jesu disippel, som har vandret korsveien. Når han blir gammel, han blir lykkeligere og lykkeligere. Og snart så går han jo ut av legeme da, og så kan han ligge der og juble og tenke, nå er det bare noen timer igjen. Så er jeg hos Jesus. Så er jeg hjemme. En kolossal herlighet som møter hver den som tror og følger mesteren. Hvorfor er man så misfornøyd med det ene og misfornøyd med det andre? Jo, man tror ikke på korsets kraft. Man tror på korset til syndens forladelse. Men man tror ikke at det store jeget trenges og så blir plassert der. 
Slik som Paulus sier, jeg er kortfestet med, Pavlu, nei, med Kristus. Og så ringakte man da korset og Jesu dyre blod. Men eh, Paulus han opplevde at Jesu tog bolig ham og begynte å leve i ham. Nettopp på grund av korset. Der begynte Jesus å leve et helt nytt liv inni ham. Og Jesus hadde jo behov for det korset hver dag, for han kom jo fra Davids ett. Så hadde han fulgt sine lyster og begjæringer som han hadde arvet, så hadde han ikke blitt Guds kraft og Guds visdom. Og når du ikke bruker korset, skal jeg si at slekt av synder kommer frem ved dig. Da kommer gjerrigheten din frem. Og, og så videre, og så videre. Da kommer det frem. Men ved korset, så løses det ut ifra det. Ja. Samme hvem du er, og samme hva du heter. Of course, I had a deep longing in my heart for many years from when I was a small boy to live a God-fearing life. But I didn't know what that meant outside of just keeping certain rules. But when I came into my teen years, then I started to seek God and ask many questions. And, and I, I sensed that I was bound up in myself with many complexes and inferiorities and tendencies. And I remember when I heard the brothers the first time at the first conference, then uh, that word came to me out of Peter where it says that you have been redeemed from the futile ways that you have inherited from your forefathers. And it was like a new light went up for me as if th this is possible I had inherited certain things and I had grown up with with uh, these complexes but they were of no blessing to my fellow man and I, I sensed that I couldn't meet people and be a blessing for them and I longed for that and then uh, when I heard that word then a hope came into my heart that by the gospel I can be freed from everything that all these rules couldn't free me from and it was like a new day the sun came up in my life and uh, and uh, and uh, I'm still in that pursuit of that life to its fullness where uh, I am free to bless my fellow man 